Hi guys, Daniel here. Hope you guys are doing well and I hope you guys are studying hard. I'm sure you guys are. So uh, today we've got paper two of the Edexcel GCSC uh, foundation calculator paper for June 2023. So last year's paper. And uh, yeah, a couple of tricky questions in there for sure, especially as you get uh, towards the end, especially with the graph matching at the very end, to be fair. But yeah, hopefully you don't find it too difficult. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. You have the timestamps in the description, so you can just easily go to whatever question you like. You don't have to watch the whole thing. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, let's get into it. Okay, so question one says we need to write 6,184 correct to the nearest 100. Well, if I look at the number, the part of the number that starts with 100, 184, well, that to the nearest 100 is going to be 200, isn't it? So the total answer or the final answer is just going to be 6,200. And then question two says we need to write 0 0.7 as a fraction. Now, 0 0.7 as a fraction is just 7 over 10. So that one's done. And then it says we need to change nine meters into 100 centimeters. Now, remember, how many centimeters are there in a meter? There are 100. 100 centimeters is equal to one meter. So if I want to go from meters to centimeters, I need to go from one to 100, which is times about 100. So you're just going to do nine times 100, isn't it? So do nine times 100, which is just equal to 900. So it's just 900 centimeters. That one's done. And then part four, question four, says we need to simplify uh, three times 40. Now, whenever you're simplifying a number and an algebraic term, just multiply the number parts together. So three times four is a 12, and then put the T after. So it's just going to be 12T. Now, question five says, uh, here is a list of numbers, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. And one of these numbers is a multiple of 25. Which number? Well, what you can do is just list the multiples of 25 and then see which number is in the list. So we're going to have 25 and the next one's going to be 50. Keep adding 25, 75, and then uh, 100, isn't it? Out of these numbers, it's 100. So it's just 100. And that's question five. Let's go to question six. And question six says, Shari has a fair ordinary dice. She rolls the dice once. On the probability scale, mark with the cross X, the probability that Shari gets the number seven. Well, she she's rolling an ordinary dice. Well, an ordinary dice has six sides, one to six. So she can't get a number seven. It's impossible. So it has to be a zero here. So you've got to mark this here. And then the next one, part B, says on the probability scale, mark with the cross X, the probability that Shari gets an even number. Okay, well, remember, a dice has six options, one to six. I'm going to label this one, two, three, four, five six the probability that shari gets an even number well how many even numbers are there from one to six there are one two three there are three two four and six and there's a total uh of options of six right so it's going to be three out of six so i'm going to say probability of being even it's going to be three options out of six and this simplifies to one over two so therefore we're just going to mark one over two and that will be it that is question six Okay, so question seven says, here is a triangle. The triangle is accurately drawn and we need to measure the length of AC. Now, this one is just pretty straightforward. You're just going to get your ruler and just measure uh, the distance from A to C. Now, unfortunately, my laptop doesn't have an electronic software where I can measure this uh, triangle, so I'm, I won't be able to do it. But again, you're just going to measure and see what you get. Now, the mark scheme says that the range is going to be from uh, 9.1 to 9.5. And that would be the range. So anything in between that, you'll be fine. You'll get the mark. And then part B says we need to measure the size of angle B. Again, I won't be able to uh, measure the angle. But all you're going to do is just get your protractor and measure the angle here. It's definitely obtuse. The mark scheme says that the angle is between 104 to 108. So as long as you can use your protractor and measure angles, then you're going to be fine. So those are part A and B done. And then part C says here is a different triangle. QP is equal to QR, so QP and QR are the same. It says we need to write down the mathematical name of this triangle. Now, remember, when two sides are the same in the triangle, then this is just an isosceles triangle. So I'm going to just write isosceles here. Isosceles triangle. And that also means that the base angles are the same as well, so don't forget that too. And that's it, and that's uh, question seven uh, finished. Okay, so question eight says, the diagram shows three motorway service stations, P, Q, and R on the map. The map has a scale of one centimeter to four kilometers. And we can see that P to Q is eight centimeters and Q to R is 16 centimeters. Uh, we need to work out the real distance of P to R. 
Well, firstly, what you'd want to do is work out the scale distance of P to R, the distance on the diagram, right? And we can see it goes from 8 to, P to Q goes from 8 centimeters and Q to R is 16. So we could just say that the total distance, right, in terms of the drawing here, is just going to be the 8 centimeters plus the 16 centimeters, which is just equal to 24. Right now, remember the scale is one centimeter for every four kilometers, right? So, if we want to work out the real distance, right, all we're going to do is say, well, we'll scratch this out one more time one centimeter is equal to uh, four kilometers, and we know that the map here is uh, 24 centimeters long. So, how do we go from a one to a 24? We we'll just go times by 24, meaning that we have to times the four by 24 as well, and that will give us the total distance in kilometers. So, I'm going to do this in my calculator It'll be four times 24. It's equal to 96. So the answer is just 96 kilometers. And that's it. Okay, so question nine says, here are the first five terms of a sequence, 3, 18, 13, 18, and 23. We need to write down the next term of the sequence. So first, you've got to look to see if there's any patterns going on. To go from a 3 to an 8, we have to add 5. To go from an 8 to a 13, we have to add 5. And then to go from a 13 to an 18, we have to add 5. So we can see that the term after the 23 is just going to be uh, adding 5. Sorry, let me put a 5 here, not 3. I'm going to add 5 to get the term after 23, which is going to be 28. So the next term is equal to 28. And as well as that, you can see that the terms, the numbers at the ends are just alternating between 3 and 18. It goes 3, then 8, then 3, then 8, 3 and 8. So they're alternating between 3 and 8, sorry, not 3 and 18. 3 and then 8. So that's another way you could have done it as well. So yeah, that's part A. And then part B says we need to write down the ratio of the second term to the fourth term. Give your answer, give your ratio in its simplest form. Well, what is the second term of this sequence? It's an 8 here with the ratio of the fourth term, which is 18. So it's going to be 8 to 18. Can we simplify this? Yes, we can, because we can divide by 2 to give us 4 to 9. And this can't get any simpler. So yeah, the answer is just going to be 4 to 9. And that's it for question 9. Okay, so question 10 says, this graph can be used to find the cost of parking a car in a car park for up to 12 hours. Mm -hmm. So we've got the number of hours on the horizontal axis and the vertical and the, and the cost on the vertical axis. Part A says we need to use the graph to find the cost of parking a car for four hours. So all you're going to do is just go to four hours on your on your horizontal axis, which is right here. You're going to go up and see what cost that corresponds to, which is going to be over here, isn't it? Which is quite clearly six pounds. So uh, to park a car for four hours will cost you six pounds. Part B says Justin drives into the car park at eight o'clock in the morning. When he drives out of the car park, he has to pay nine pounds. At what time does Justin drive out of the car park? Well, what we need to work out is how long he was in the car park for, right? And we can do this because we know how much it cost him, it cost him nine pounds. So in part, we had to look at the horizontal axis to figure out what the cost is because we need the number of hours. Now for part B, it's the other way around. We know the cost is nine pounds. So we're going to look at the vertical axis and then go to our line and see how long that corresponds to. Now we over here. And that is six six hours, right? So we can see that Justin was in the car park for six hours. Now, if he arrived at eight o'clock in the morning, well, what is, what time is six hours after eight o'clock in the morning? That's just uh, two p.m., isn't it? So you could write as also you could just add this on uh, twenty twenty four hours. So it'll be fourteen hundred, or it'll just be two p.m. So I will just write two p.m. Out. And that's it. So I will just write as well six hours after eight a.m is equal to 2, 1400 p.m. or 2 p.m. Just so it's super clear. And that's it. And that's question 10 finished. Okay, so question 11 says, the table shows information about the weights of the people in the hotel lift. So we've got the weights on the left and the number of people on the right. And it says, show that the total weight of the people in the lift is less than 1,200 kg. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a third column this here and i'm just going to call this total weight right and that's going to be for each uh weight class isn't it so i'm going to total weight here and i'm just going to draw boxes like this uh like this like this so i don't have a ruler so you're gonna have to bear with me apologies like this and like that right okay now for each class for example the weight for 40 kg you only had one person so there's only going to be a total weight of 40 kg here right we just multiply these together isn't it right 40 
one lot of 40 is just 40, isn't it? And then this one, there are two people here with a weight of 50. So we're just going to times these together. And I'm sure you can see that we just need to multiply these together. And this will give us the total weights for each of these classes. So 50 times 2 is 100. 60 times 4 is uh, 240. It's here. 7 times... 70 times 5 is going to be uh, 350. Now, by the way, you do have a calculator. I'm just doing it in my head. 80 times 3 is uh, 240 again. And uh, 90 times 1 is 90. So now the total weight is just going to be the sum of all of these numbers here. And I will do this in my calculator. So I'm just going to write total weight. Total weight is going to be equal to 40 plus 100 plus 240 plus 350 plus 240 plus 90 and i'll put this into my calculator and see what it gives me so i'll put this here and uh yeah that should be fine and then it's going to be uh 40 40 plus 100 plus 240 plus 350 plus 240 240 plus 90 and this gives us 1060 so total is 1060 which is less than 1200 so that's it, we proved it. And uh, that will give you the th three marks for question 11. That's it. Okay, so question 12 says, shape A is reflected in a mirror line to give shape B. And part A says we need to draw the mirror line on the grid. So when you've got something like this here, if you can kind of gauge it, right? The mirror line is gonna be somewhere around here, right? Because it looks equally distant from either point, right? So I'm gonna just have a guess and say, it's gonna be through this hair, that square in the middle. So something like this. And if you could just um have a look. So for example, to go from this point now, I need to go down one to the right by one like this. And then that's the same point here, like this one here. And then for example, you can see as well, uh, for example, this point here. I need to go up two and then to the left by three. And then for this one, I have to go uh to the right by two and then down by three. You can see that there's a bit of symmetry here like this, isn't it? So yeah, this is definitely going to be the mirror line here. And that's it. So you can just kind of gauge it. So just do this here. Okay, so that's fine. And uh, part B now says, let's see. It says, Alex is asked to reflect the shape P in the X axis. Here is the diagram Alex draws. So we've got this here. This is the shape P and he's meant to reflect in the X axis. And he's got this. Explain the mistake Alex has made. Well, the X axis is this horizontal line here. He hasn't reflected it in this horizontal line. He's reflected it in this vertical line, hasn't he? So you can just say that Alex's mistake is he reflected, he reflected uh, shape P in the y-axis instead y axis instead and that will be it okay so question 13 says there are 50 teachers in the school this is 1 16th of the total number of people in the school work out the total number of people in the school okay so we've got 50 teachers in the school right and they've told us that this is one out of 16 so you could think of this as parts right you could say that the teachers the 50 teachers that they've told us about, right? This is just going to equal one part. So let me just get my pen. So I'm going to say that one part must be equal to the 50 teachers, right? Or we could just say one part is equal to 50, right? Because there may be, as well as teachers, there may be pupils in the school. So we're just going to say that one part is equal to 50 people, actually, yeah? Now, if this is one out of 16, then the total number of people would represent 16 parts, wouldn't it? So we just need to work out what 16 parts represents. And we do this from going from one to 16, and we're going to times by 16, aren't we? So we're just going to have to times by 16 to figure out what the answer is. And I've already got it here, 16 times 50 or 50 times 16. And this is equal to 800. So therefore, it's just 800 people. And that's it for question 13. Okay, so question 14 says, packets of sweets are put into boxes, right? We've got the packets and boxes at the top. It says, each packet is a cuboid 80 millimeters by 60 millimeters by 20 millimeters. And each box is a cuboid of 72 centimeters by 48 centimeters by 24 centimeters. And we need to work out the greatest number of packets that can be put into each box. Okay, so we've got packets here, which are obviously a lot smaller than 
the boxes, right? We need to figure out how many of these go into this, right? Now we're dealing with three dimensional objects. So what you actually need to do is actually just work out the capacity of this box, right? Which in other words is the volume and see how many of these can fit into this entire volume. So we need to work out the volume of both of these essentially. Now, but firstly though, the boxes and packets are in two different units of measurement. So what you want to do is you want to convert them to the same measurement first. Now, we've got milli millimeters here, and I'm going to convert this into centimeters, right? Because this is in centimeters. You could have done it. You could have converted this one too to, milli to millimeters, but I'm going to convert millimeters to centimeters. Now, you need to remember, though, that there are 10 millimeters, right, in one centimeter. So if I want to go from the millimeters to centimeters, I need to go from this 10 to this one and you divide by 10, right? Meaning that we can convert these by just dividing by 10. So I'm going to do this here. 80 divided by 10 is just 8. So this is going to be the same as 8 centimeters. 60 divided by 10 is 6. So 6 centimeters here. And this is just 2, isn't it? So therefore, we could say that the packet, instead of it being 80 by 60 by 20, it's going to be 8 by 6 by 2 centimeters, right? Same thing. And now, remember, we're trying to work out the volume of this cube. It's just going to be the length times the width times the height. So we're just going to multiply these numbers together. So I'm going to write this here. I'm going to say volume, right, vol for short, volume of packet is going to equal these numbers multiplied together. 8 times by 6 times by 2. And uh, you can put this into your calculator. But 8 times 6 is 48. 48 times 2 is 96. This is 96. But you can put this into your calculator. This is going to be centimeters cubed. And this is going to be the volume of one packet. Now, we need to know how many of these 96 centimeters cubes go into this. So we need to now calculate the volume of the box. So I'm going to do this here. I'm going to say volume of the box now. This is going to equal the 72 times by the 48 times by the 24 and then working this out now i have to do this on my calculator i can't do that in my head 72 times 48 times by uh, 24 is equal to 82,944 82,944 centimeters cubed right so to answer the question the greatest number of packets that can be into to, that can be put into each of these boxes right you're just going to work out how many 96s go into 8 to 2,144. So you're just going to work out, I'm going to say, greatest greatest number of packets, right, is going to be the 8 to 2,944 divided by the 96, because we want to work out how many 96s go into 8 to 2,144. So I do this here. 82,944 over 96 is equal to 864. So the answer is just 80, 864 packets. So that's, it. And that's it. And that will give you the, how many marks? Let's give you four marks for question 14. Okay, so question 15 says, here is a fair ordinary dice and a fair eight-sided spinner. Charlie throws the dice once and spins the spinner once. Is Charlie more likely to get a number less than three on the dice or a number greater than five on the spinner? You must show all your working. So with this question, all you need to do is work out both probabilities and see which value is greater, right? Which value is larger? So let's start with the first one, right? We're dealing with a dice, right? A fair ordinary dice we know has six sides. It goes from one to six. So I'm going to say for the dice, for the dice, I'm going to say the probability of me getting a number, I need the number less than three, right? Well, how many numbers are less than three in a dice? Well, it goes from one to six. So there's only gonna be two, one and two, right? So there's gonna be two options out of how many numbers are there, there are in a dice, there are six. So the probability of me getting a number less than three in a dice is two out of six, which can be simplified to become one over three. So that's the probability of me getting a number less than three on the dice. Now I need a number greater than five on the spinner. So I'm going to write spinner here. And I need the probability of getting a number greater than five, right? Well, the spinner is fair. It's a fair eight-sided spinner, right? Uh, it goes from one to eight. How many numbers are there? Are, are there greater than five? Well, there's going to be one, six, two, seven, 
three, eight. There's going to be three options, which are greater than five, six, seven, and eight. So I'm going to put a three on the top. And this is out of how many? Eight. Remember, it's from one to eight. So it's just three apes, which can't be simplified anymore. So I've got these two. I've got one over three and I've got three over eight. I just need to determine which value of these is greater. Now, this is a calculator paper. So you can just put this into a calculator and see what the decimal versions are. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. So I'm going to do, for example, one over three, which is, is we know it's 0 0.3 recurring, actually. So I'm going to write this out. This is 0 0.3 recurring, like that. And then three over eight, I need to work out. 3 over 8, this is equal to 0 0.375, 0 0.375, and this will have zeros here, like this, wouldn't it? Now, this one is clearly bigger than that one, right? Because this is 333, if you want to think of it like that, and this is 375, yeah? So this is definitely, definitely bigger. So we can just say that 3 over 8 is bigger than 1 over 3. So uh, Charlie... Charlie is more, more likely, whoops, so I can't spell properly today, more likely to get the probability of a number, right, number, and I just write greater than five. And that's it, finished. Okay, so question 16 says, Paolo drives at an average speed of 56 kilometers per hour for one hour and 45 minutes. We need to work out the distance Paolo drives. Now, firstly, what you notice about this question is you can see speed. They've given you a uh, time, hour, 45 minutes, and ask you for the distance. So this is just compound measures, right? You need to just remember your formula, which connects speed, distance, and time. And you can use a formula triangle. So I'm going to just draw one here. Put this here. And uh, you could just say then that we've got triangle like this you're going to put s here you're going to put d here and you're going to put t here so the most common one is that speed is equal to the distance divided by the time right that's the most common one but in this case we're looking for distance and all you do is you just cover the letter in this case if i cover the d that will just leave with s and t so we can say that the distance is equal to the speed times the time so we just need to work out what both of these are and then multiply them together now firstly they've told us that the speed is 56 kilometers per hour so i'm gonna write speed is equal to 56 here now remember this is in kilometers per hour the time they've actually given us uh given us one hour and 45 minutes what i would need to do is whenever you're dealing with these types of questions you need to make sure the units of measurements are the same so the speed is in kilometers per hour so it's in hours we need the time to be in hours too so the problem here is this 45 minutes we need to convert this into hours so what i could what i like to do is when i do these questions like i said the time is equal to one hour right plus the 45 minutes right i'm gonna write plus because it means the same thing i need to convert this into hours now remember there are 60 minutes in one hour so to go from minutes to hours i need to go from 60 to one i'm going to divide by 60. So it's going to be, if I want to figure out what 45 minutes in terms of hours, I just divide by 60. So I'm going to say 45 minutes is going to equal 45 divided by 60 hours, right? And this is just uh, three quarters, but you could just put it in your calculator just to double check. Oops. Yeah, three quarters or 0.75. Yeah, so I'm going to write 0.75 hours. Meaning that this time here, we can actually write as one hour plus 0 0.75 hours which is just 1.75 hours in total so therefore we could say just to finish off the speed we know is 56 the time is 1.75 hours so the distance which you know is speed times the time is just going to be 56 times by 1.75 so i just put this into the calculator and see what we get 56 times by 1.75 this is equal to 98 so the answer is just 98 kilometers and that's it for question 16 Okay, so question 17 says, there are three cinemas A, B, and C. The mean number of seats per cinema is 380. There are 350 seats in cinema A, 250 seats in cinema B, and we need to work out the number of seats in cinema C. Now, firstly, what you want to do is you want to remind yourself of the formula to calculate the mean. Now, remember, the mean is just going to be equal to the sum of all data points, right? Sum of all data. This is generally speaking, right? divided by the number of data that you have, right? The total number of data, right? Put this here. So, oops, put this here. And then let me put total at the beginning of that. So put 
I put total here just so it's clear, right? This is the general formula to calculate the mean. Now, let's provide context with the question that we have. We're dealing with seats in cinemas, right? Now, I'm going to say that the mean number of seats, right? The mean number of seats per cinema, right? It's just going to be equal to the, the number of seats in all of the cinemas, right? So I'm going to say, I'm going to write number of seats in cinema A, right? Plus the number, I'll write in B now, plus the number of seats in C. Uh, number, I'll write number in C, just so it's just easier and just quicker. Number in C, right? Divided by the total number of cinemas, right? Because we're dealing with the number of seats in the cinema. So I'm going to write total number of cinemas. Now, it's our job to figure out as much of, as much information as possible in this equation. Now, let's have a look. They told us that the mean number of seats per cinema is 380. So we actually know the mean. We know what this left-hand side is, is 380, they've told us, right? Now, if I just get another fraction bar, like this, uh, the number of seats that are in A, they told us is 350. So I'm going to 350 here. Plus the number of seats that are in B is 250. So I'm going to 250 here. Plus the number of seats in C, which is actually what we're trying to figure out. So I'm just going to write number of, I'll write number in C, right? Divided by the total number of cinemas. There are three cinemas, A, B, and C. So it's just going to be three here. So we've got this equation here, right? Now, remember, we're trying to figure out the number of seats in C, which is this part of the equation. Right? So what we can do is say, well, this is just algebra, essentially. I can call this x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tidy this up first. So I'm going to say I've got 380 is equal to, and then 350 plus 250 is just uh, 600, isn't it? So we 600 plus, and I'm going to call this x. I'm going to call this x. I'm going to call this x, right? That means I have 600 plus x over 3. So now I've got an equation I need to solve. I need to just get uh, this x by itself. So firstly, if I want to get this x by itself, I need to get rid of this 3 here. And I need to get rid of this 600 here in blue, right? Firstly, you want to get rid of the fraction first so you can move things around. So I'm going to first do 380 times by 3. And this will give me 600 plus x, right? If I times both sides by 3, like this. So I'm going to put this into my calculator. 380 times by 3. This gives me, uh, let's move this over here. 380 times by 3 is going to give me 1140. Then I've got 600 plus x. So now to get uh, x, now I'm just going to do 1140, take away 600. And this will give me uh, 1140, take away 600. It's 540. So I can say this is X, and I can say that means that X is equal to 540. So the number of seats that are in cinema C is 540. And that's it. And that will be your answer for question 17. Okay, so question 18 says, Asher buys 180 cans of cola. The cans are sold in packs. There are 12 cans in each pack. Each pack costs three pounds, and we need to work out the total cost of the cola Asher buys. Now, firstly, we know that the cans are in packs of 12 isn't it right so i'm going to put one pack here and we know that this is equal to 12 cans and we also know the cost of one pack which is three pounds so if we need to work out the total cost and we need to work out how many packs i shall buy so now how can we do this? Well, we know that one pack costs one pack is worth 12 cans, and we know that Asha buys 180 cans. So we need to work out how many 12s go into 180, don't we? So what we're going to do is we're going to work out, I'm going to say uh, number of packs. This is going to equal 180 divided by 12, right? How many 12s go into 180? And I'll put this in my calculator. Put this here. 180 over 12 is equal to 15. So therefore I can say that he must or she, Asha, must buy 15 cans. 15 packs, I should say. 15 packs. Right. Now we know how many packs has been bought. We can work out the cost. Because remember, we know that one pack is worth three pounds. That means 15 packs. Well, we're just going to times by 15, aren't we? Three times 15 is 45. So therefore, the total cost of the cola that Asher buys is just £45. And that is our part A. So I'll put £45 there. Now part B says, 
Ethan buys a box of 24 cans of lemonade for £7, right? There are 330 milliliters of lemonade in each can. Work out the cost of 100 milliliters of lemonade. All right. So, firstly, we know that uh, there are 24 cans for £7, right? So, I'm going to write 24 cans is equal to £7 from the first sentence. Now, there are there are 330 milliliters of lemonade in each can. So I can say one can, I'm going to write here, one can, we know, is equal to 330 milliliters. We need to work out the cost of 100 milliliters of lemonade. Okay, so firstly, we need to work out how much one can will cost, don't we, right? We know that 24 cans cost seven pounds. So let's work out how much one can will cost. We're just going to divide by 24, aren't we? To go from a 24 to a 1, we need to divide by 24. So I'm going to do this here as well. So I'm going to do 7 over 24. Uh, this is going to give me 7 divided by 24. It's going to give me 0 0.296 recurring, isn't it? So I'm just going to write 0 0.29. Just double check. 2916 recurring, right? This is how much it costs. So approximately around, around 29 pence. Yeah. So we'll just leave it at this for now, though. But that's one can, and we also know how much, uh, in terms of milliliters, how many there is for one can. There's 330 milliliters for one can. So we can say then that, remember, I'll just highlight these. These quantities are both representing one can, aren't they? This price here and this milliliter said they're both representing one can. So we can actually say that the cost for, uh, or I should say the 29 pence or 29 point. 29.6, blah, blah, blah. This has to equal the 330 milliliters, isn't it? Because they are both representing one can. And the question asks us to work out the cost of 100 milliliters. So we need to work out what 100 milliliters is here. Now how can we do this? Well, how many times does 100 go into 330? Well, you can just um, divide, can't you? So we'll do this here. So we're going to do 330 divided by 100 is equal to... 3.3 yeah so we need to divide by 3.3 to get to 100 uh, milliliters so i'll put this here meaning that we have to divide this cost by 3.3 so i'll divide this by 3.3 and then now then i'm going to round it so it's going to be i'm going to get the answer up again which was um did i have it oh it was here was it 7 over 24 it was this one yeah so i'm going to 7 over 24 which is this answer here and i'm going to divide this by 3.3 this gives me 0 0.088, right? So it's going to be 0 0.088, blah, blah, blah. And it says to the nearest penny, right? To the nearest penny, that's just going to be 0 0.09, isn't it? So therefore, that's just going to be 9 pence. So we can just set the answer. It's just 9p. And that's it. Okay, so question 19 says, 240 people work at a factory. Of these people, 150 have a car. 110 have a bicycle and 65 of the people who have a bicycle do not have a car. Use this information to complete the frequency tree. Okay, so firstly, they've told us how many people have a car and that would be over here. So I'm going to put 150 over here. And we know that there are a total of 240. So the people that don't have a car or do not have a car is going to be 240 take away 150, which is 90. So that's the first thing. Now, they've told us that 110 have a bicycle. Now, you've got to be careful here because you can see that there's a branch for having a bicycle here and there's also a branch for having a bicycle here. So there's two parts to it. So we can't put 110 in either one of these because it's both of them, right? Now, we have to use the information given to us. They've told us that 65 of the people who have a bicycle do not have a car, right? So where are you if you don't have a car? You're down here, but you also have a bicycle. That means you're over here. So that means that this is going to be 65. Right now, we can work out a lot of things from here because if this is 65 here, then this one underneath is just going to be 90 take away 65, which is going to just be 25. And as well as that, there are 65 people that have a bicycle here, and we know that there is 110 people that have a bicycle altogether. So, to work out this one, we're just going to do the amount of people that have a bicycle altogether, and we're going to take away the amount of people that have a bicycle that don't own a car, which is 65. So, I'm going to put this into my calculator 100 and uh. So here, 110 take away 65 is equal to 45. So I've got 45 here. And that's fine because if this is 150 in total and there's 45 here, this is just going to be 105, isn't it? 
So now we've completed the frequency tree. So uh, let me just write about these arrows, wrap this one out and wrap that one out. Okay. So part B now says we need to, it says what percentage of the 150 people who have a car also have a bicycle? Well, what we need to firstly work out is the fraction of people that have a car that also have a bicycle. And that's going to be 45. So it's going to be 45 on the numerator. And we're doing a percentage of the 150 people. So it's going to be 45 over 150. This will be the fraction of people who have a car that also have a bicycle. To make it into a percentage, I'm going to times 100. So I'm just going to put this into the calculator and see what we get. So it's going to be um, 45, 45 over 150 times 100. This is equal to 30. So the answer is just 30%. And that's it. And that's question uh, 19 finished. Okay, so question 20 says we need to work out the value of 25 minus the square root of 43.87 divided by 6 plus 2.1 squared. And we need to write down all the figures on your calculator display. So this isn't too bad. We're just punching in numbers into our calculator. So I'm going to clear this. I'm going to get a fraction bar. It's going to be 25 take away the square root of 43.87. And we're going to divide this by 6 plus 2.1 all squared. And then we get this here, and then we need to write down all the figures. So that's going to be 1.7652, 1.7652, and then uh, 1.7652, 7923.7923. And I'll give you two marks. And then part B says we need to work out the value of the reciprocal of 0.65. Now remember, whenever they ask you for the reciprocal of a number, you just do one over whatever the number is. So the reciprocal is just going to be 1 over 0.625 and then you're just going to put this into your calculator 1 over 0.625 and this gives me 8 over 5 so the answer is just 8 over 5 or if you want to put it as a decimal doesn't matter 1.6 so this is perfectly fine and that is our question 20 finished okay question 21 says we need to write 60 as a product of its prime factor so i'm just going to write a factor tree and then 60 is either so i'm going to put a 2 and i'm going to put a 30 here then I can break this down to be 2 and a 15. Then I can break this down to be a 3 and a 5. Now, at the ends of each of the branches are prime numbers. So we know we can stop here and circle all of these. So therefore, all you're going to do now is just times them together. So it's just going to be 2 times by 2 times by 3 times by 5. Or you can write an in index notation. So it'll be 2 squared times by 3 times by 5. And that's it. And that's question 21 finished. Okay, so question 22 says there are 48 counters in a bag. There are only red counters and blue counters in the bag. The number of red counters to the number of blue counters is in a ratio 1 to 2. Helen has to work out how many red counters are in the bag. She says there are 24 red counters in the bag because 1 is half of 2 and 24 is half of 48. Is Helen correct? You must give a reason for your answer. So it's only one mark, but what I would do is just essentially work out how many red counters there would be if they've given us the amount of counters and the ratio, right? So I'm going to actually work this out. So I'm going to say, well, if I have red to blue, right? We know this is the ratio one to two. I remember whenever you're dealing with ratios, you're just splitting the total quantity into different parts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the one and two together. One plus two is equal to three. So therefore we can see that there are three parts in total. And those three parts, all right, three parts in total. These three parts must represent the 48 counters. So I can say that three parts is equal to 48 counters. Now, once you know how many parts there are, you can work out what one part represents. And we can do this just by dividing by three, right? If three parts is equal to 48 counters, then divided by three, one part must be 16. You can check in your calculator. So one part is equal to 16 counters. And that is how many uh, red counters there must be, because we know that red counters represents one part. So we could just say from there, there are, there are 16 red counters. And that must mean Hela, Helen is incorrect, right? So you can just say Helen is incorrect. And that's it. That's finished. Okay, so question 23 says we have N, which is in between minus 2 inclusive and uh, excluding 5. N is an integer. We need to write down the greatest possible value of N. Well, firstly, I would list all the possible values of N, right? Because it's, there's there's a finite amount. It's going to be from, we're going to include minus 2 and the integer. So we're just going to go up in 1. So minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 
four and that would be it isn't it because we're not including five and well these are all of the possible values the greatest one's going to be the one at the end which is four so we've got four here and that's it and then part b says on the number line show the inequality of m being a bit minus four inclusive and one not inclusive right so all you're going to do here is go to minus four which is here on a number line and you're going to put a closed circle because we are including minus four right and then you're going to go to one on your number line which is over here you're going to put an open circle because we are not including one and then all you're going to do is just draw a line through so it's going to be like this essentially and i just straighten it up this like that and uh this will be the answer for part b so that's done and let's go to part c uh, it says solve uh, 2 over 5g minus 4 is less than 6. Now, this is just a standard inequality, and they work the same way as the same way as equations, right? So you essentially want to get the g on its own. So firstly, what I would do is I would, let me just write this here. I'm going to add the minus 4 to get it onto the other side, isn't it? That's the first thing I want to do. So that will give me 2 over 5g is less than 6 plus 4. And that would mean that 2 over 5g is less than 10. Now to get uh to get g, firstly I need to get rid of this denominator of five, right? I need to get rid of this division. So I'm going to times both sides by five. If I times both sides by five, then I'll get two g is less than ten times five is fifty. And then now to get g, we just need to divide by two, don't we? So we're going to get g is less than fifty divided by two is twenty-five. So therefore g is just less than twenty-five. And that's it. That's question twenty-three finished. Okay, so question 24 says, here is a triangle and a rectangle, right? We've got the base to be 8 and the height to be 6x for the rectangle, for the triangle, sorry. And the rectangle has a base of 5 and a height of 4x minus 1. It says all measurements are in centimetres and it tells us that the area of the triangle is 10 centimetres greater, 10 centimetres ten centimeter squares greater, sorry, than the area of the rectangle. I will need to work out the value of x. Now, this is a typical algebraic worded problem whereby they give you some sentence in English right and it's up to you to be able to translate this into a mathematical equation so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to break down this sentence into a lot of different parts so the first part I think is significant right is that they've said the area of the triangle right that's the first part and then the next part I can see is is right is and then I've got 10 centimeters squared greater than right and then I've got, what kind of can I finish off with? I'll just do it in this one here. The area of the rectangle. So there's four parts to this sentence, in my opinion. And we need to break this down into different parts uh, algebraically and mathematically. So firstly, the area of the triangle, right? I'm going to call this, I'm just going to call this AT for area of the triangle. And uh, can I work this out? Well, we can. Remember the formula for the area of a triangle, I'll do it here. Area is just equal to the base times by the height divided by two. So in this case, we can see that, well, the base is 8 and the height is 6x. And we're going to have to divide this by 2, right? Meaning that the area, 8 times 6 is 48. So it becomes 48x divided by 2, which is equal to 24x. So we now have an expression for the area of the triangle, which is good. So I can say that we've got area of the triangle 80 is just equal to 24x. So that's fine. And now the next part of this sentence here is the word is, right? So I'm going to translate this now. So the area of the triangle, right, we know is 80. So I'm just going to put a 24x because that's the area of the triangle. And then the next part of this sentence, right, is the word is. Now, mathematically, what does is mean? Well, just think of it as a scenario. 4 plus 3 is 7, right? What can we replace is with? An equal sign. So I'm going to put equals here. So that's part, that's done. There's two parts of this sentence done. Now the next part says 10 centimeters squared greater than, right? So remember, we're dealing with areas. So essentially we're just doing 10 more, right? In terms of areas. So 10 greater or 10 more just means 10 plus. So we can put a 10 plus here for this part. And then we need to work out the area of the rectangle. We just need an expression for this. So the area of the rectangle, remember the area of any rectangle, right? It's just the base times the height. Now, I'm going to call the area of the rectangle AR. And the base, in this case, is quite clearly a 5. And then we're times them by the height, which is 4x minus 1. So I'm going to put it in a bracket like this. And I can just tidy this up a bit more. 5 times 4 is 20. So I get 20x here and then minus 5. 
So an expression for the area of the rectangle was 20x minus 5. And I, I can actually put this here. So I'm going to put 20x minus 5. And what do we have here? We've got an equation from a sentence, right? And that is the key to this type of question. So if you see this come up again, then you know that this is all you need to do. You have some sentence in English and you need to translate it into a mathematical equation. Because now we're able to figure out what X is, right? Because that's how you solve equations. You find out what X is. So we are here. Now let's tidy things up. We've got 24X, right? Equals, and then I've got a 10 minus a 5. That's just a 5, isn't it? So I can put a 5 here. Now I've got plus 20X. This. Now remember, you're trying to get x on its own. x appears on both sides, so you need to move them all over to the one side. I'm going to move the 20x over to the left because the 20x is smaller. So you always move the smaller x term over. So it's going to be minus 20x here. So that means I'll have 24x minus 20x is equal to 5. Now 24 minus 20 is 4. So 24x minus 20x is just going to be 4x. So I get 4x is equal to 5, meaning that to get x now, we need to get rid of this 4, and we do this by dividing both sides by 4, don't we? So the answer is just going to be 5 divided by 4, which is just the same as 1.25, and you can check on your calculator. And that, that's it. It means that x is equal to 1.25. And that is 4 marks. Okay, so question 25 says, Last year, a family recycled 800 kilograms of household waste. 57% of this waste was paper and glass. The weight of paper recycled to the weight of glass recycled this is a ratio of 12 to 7. We need to calculate the weight of glass the family recycled. Okay. Now, firstly, we have 800 kilograms of household waste and we have 57% 50, of it, which is paper and glass. So what we need to do firstly is work out 57%, right, of the 800 kilograms because that will represent the amount that is just uh, paper and glass, right? So how can we do this? Remember, you're doing it on non-calculated paper. You can do this very, very quickly. You're going to change this into a decimal just by dividing by 100. And this is just going to be 0 0.57. The word of just means multiplication. And then we're just times about eight. We're just times about 800. So all you're going to do is just put this into your calculator. So I get my calculator up. Put this here. So I'm going to clear this. It's going to be 0 0.57 times by 800. And this is equal to 456. So I'm going to say that we have 456 kilograms of either paper or glass, right? Now, they've told us the ratio of the weights, right? It's 12 to 7. So now I can say, well, I've got P. I'm going to write P for paper. I'm going to write G for glass. And this is in the ratio uh, 12 to 7. Like this. I remember, again, when you're dealing with ratios, it's just splitting the quantity into a certain uh, into a total amount of parts. So what we can do is say, well, we've got uh, we can do twelve plus seven, and this is equal to nineteen, right? Meaning that there are nineteen parts in total. Nineteen parts in total, and those nineteen parts must represent the total weight of the paper and the glass. So we can actually say that the nineteen parts, right? This just represents four. 456 kilograms. Whoops, I need a six here. Kg, right? Now, we need to calculate the weight of glass. Now, that means we just need to work out the amount of parts for glass in this ratio. So, firstly, what we want to do is calculate what one part represents. And we do this just by dividing by 19, don't we? So, I'm going to divide both sides by 19 here. 19 to give me one part. So, I'm going to do 456 over 19 in my calculator. 456 divided by 19. This equals 24. So one part represents 24 kilograms. And again, we're looking for the weight of glass. And that represents the seven parts, isn't it? Because it's the second part of the ratio. So it's just going to be seven parts that we need to calculate. So we're just going to times this by seven now, aren't we? So I'm going to do 24 times seven in my calculator. 24 times by seven. This is equal to 168. So therefore, the amount of weight of glass that the family recycled is just 168 kg. And that's it. That's question 25 finished. Okay, so question 26 says, a number D is rounded to one decimal place. The result is 12.7, and we need to complete the error interval for D. So with these questions, super, super easy. What I like to do is I like to draw a little table. So I'm going to draw a little table of units, right? So, yeah. And I'm going to call this ones. I'm going to call this temps. I'm going to call this one hundredths and I'm going to call this thousandths and so on and so forth, right? And this is going to be one here, this is going to be 0 0.1, it's going to be 0 0.01, and so on and so forth. Now, the question says that it's been rounded to one decimal place. Now, in regards to this table, the amount of decimal places tells me which 
part which column I go to and the decimal place which is only one is this one here so what you're going to do with this is you're going to just divide this number by two so I'm going to do it here what 0 0.1 divided by two put this in my calculator is equal to 0 0.1 over two this is equal to 0 0.05 now whatever you get for this all you're going to do is add and subtract that number and that will give you the lower and upper bound for the number 12.7 so all you're going to do for the first one i write lower low is going to be 12.7 take away 0 0.05 and then up is going to be 12.7 add 0 0.05 and you can put this in your calculator 12.7 take away 0 0.05 this is equal to 12.65 so we've got 12.65 here so that will go here 12.65 and then upper we're just going to add it on and you can see quite clearly that's just going to be 12.75 but i'll just show you anyway you get this here 12.75 so that will be our answer and that's it okay so question 27 says tamsin buys a house with a value of 150,000 pounds the value of Tamsin's house increases by 4% each year. Rachel buys a house with a value of £160,000. The value of Rachel's house increases by 1.5% each year. At the end of two years, whose house has the greater value? You must show how you get your answer. Now, this typical, this type of question there, we can see that we've got an initial amount, right? And it's increasing by a certain percentage each year. This is just a typical compound interest question. So to do this, you need to remember the formula for compound interest. So I'm going to just write compound interest here interest term compound interest right and the formula is if i have uh, a value v which is what i'm trying to get to this is going to equal p the principal amount that i'm at the start multiplied by one plus r over 100 right the r represents the rate of interest the percentage and then we do this we put this to the power of the number of years that we're doing it to this is the formula for compound interest. So all I need to do is just apply this with the information there. So we've got two people, we've got Tamsin, right, Tam Sinham. And if I do this here, well, the value, remember, uh, we don't know it, that's what we're gonna work out. So the principal value is the amount that she started with, or he, right, which is 150,000. So I've got 150,000 like this. And then we're going to multiply it by one plus R is the rate of interest. Now, this is the percentage here, which is just going to be 4. So it's going to be 4 over 100. And then we do it to the power of the number of years. Now, they're both doing it for two years. At the end of two years, it says. So I'm going to put a power of 2 here. So all I need to do is just write this out, and this will give me the answer. So I'll put this in. And I'll do it here. Nope, actually, I'll do it. Uh, I'll do it here. Yeah, I'll do it here. I'll do it here. So it's going to be 150,000 multiplied by uh, 1 plus 4 over 100 to the power of 2. And this gives me 162,240 pounds. So we can say at the end of the two years, Tamsin will have 162,240 pounds. Let me just double check I've written that correctly. Uh, yes, I have. Brilliant. So that is Tamsin's amount after two years. Now we need to do the, the exact same thing for Rachel. So it's going to be V is equal to, and then she starts with 160,000 pounds. So 16000, and it's going to be 1 plus, the rate of interest in this case is 1.5. So I'm going to put 1.5 here, over 100 to the power of 2. Again, it's for two years. So all I need to do is just plug this in instead. So I do this here, and I'm going to change this to, uh, I'm going to change the 4 to 1.5. And I'm going to change the 150,000 to 160,000. So now this is going to be the answer for Rachel. Put this in, and she gets 164,836. So 164,836. So now let's read the question again. It says, at the end of the two years, your house has a greater value. You must show how you get your answer. Well, we can see quite clearly Rachel gets more money at the end of two years. So therefore, Rachel's house will have the greater value. So you can just say, you can say Rachel, Rachel's house, right? As... 164,836 is greater than 162,240. And that's it. That will be your answer for question uh, 27. Okay, so question 28 says, here are five graphs, A, B, C, D, and E. And it says, the table shows the equation of these graphs, right? 
and uh, we need to match the letter of each graph with, with its equation. And this is a three marker. I'm going to zoom in so we can see it a bit better, right? So we've got these five graphs here. We've got the equations. Now, how do we do this? Before I start, you need to make sure before your exam, you are familiar with the different types of graphs that you can get. And these are linear graphs, quadratic graphs, cubic graphs, reciprocal graphs, and so on and so forth right now. Firstly, we're dealing with the first one here. So we've got y equals x squared minus 4x. Now, when I look at this expression here, I can see that the highest power of any x term is a 2. This tells me that this is a quadratic. This is a quadratic equation. So I'm just going to write this here. This is a quadratic equation. And we should know that the general shape of a quadratic could either be a U shape like this, or it could be an upside down U like this. It's an upside down U when your X squared term is actually negative. Now, in this case, this is X squared, which is just one X squared, which is a positive. So it's definitely going to have this shape. So all we need to do is just go to our graphs and see which one of these has that shape. And it's quite clearly a B, isn't it? So this is definitely the quadratic. So I'm going to put a B here. That's that. So I'm going to take that. And now the graph uh, for the second one is y is equal to x plus 3. Again, you should identify this is in the form of uh, y equals mx plus c, right? And this would mean that this is a linear graph, right? So this is just a line, right? Now, what we need to do is ask ourselves, well, how many lines do we have in our graphs? Well, we actually have two, right? So we can actually kill two birds with one stone here, right? Now, how do we identify which one is our graph? Now, firstly, the gradient represents the number in front of the x. Now, in this case, there is no number here, but we know that that's a 1, isn't it, right? That's just an invisible 1. So therefore, we can say that the gradient is 1. Now, when the gradient of a line is positive, it means that the graph is going upwards. If the gradient is negative, it's going downwards. So in our case, this is a positive 1. So the graph must be going upwards, meaning that this here is a D, right? The second one is D for sure. And as well as that, the y-intercept is the number at the end, c, and that's a positive 3, and you can see it goes through the positive y-axis, so it's definitely d. And that must mean that we can figure out what the other line is. Now, if I look at the options here, the only other option has to be the last one. And again, this is in the form of y equals mx plus c, because if I swap these two over, the minus 2x and the 5, then this is just the same as saying y equals minus 2x plus 5. And we can see this is in the exact same form. So this is another linear graph, a line. And we can see quite clearly that the gradient is the number in front of the x, which is a minus 2, right? Minus 2, which means that the graph is going downwards because the gradient is negative. So that must mean it's definitely A. Because it's a line, the gradient is negative, it's going downwards. Perfect. So that's, that's that. So we could put A here for sure. Now we've got two options. Now, the next option is y is equal to x cubed minus 2. Now, again, you need to be familiar with your different types of graphs. The highest power of the x is a 3. This is a cubic graph. Now, I'm going to write cubic here. Cubic. And this here is just a transformation of the graph of y equals x cubed. And this graph actually looks like this. Something you should be familiar with before your exam. The graph just looks like this. Now, the minus 2 actually just translates the graph. It just shifts it downwards by two units. So we need to just check to see if there's any graphs that closely match this one that I've sketched here. Right? It goes like this, and it's like an S, like a cumulative frequency is in the second S. So are there any that match it? Yeah, definitely E, isn't it? Right? It's definitely E. So it's going to be that one there. And then by process of elimination, the only graph that's remaining is C, right? And uh, as well as that, though, even if you didn't do it this order, you should be familiar with this graph here. This is called the reciprocal graph. I'm going to write reciprocal here. Reciprocal. And this is the graph of y equals 1 over x, right? This is something you should be familiar with, and it's this graph over here. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So the order is B, D, E, C, and A. And that will give you the three marks. And that's question 28 finished. And that's the entirety of page 2 for foundation finished. Hi right, guys, Daniel here. Hope you guys are doing well. So uh, yeah, we made it to the end of uh, paper two. Uh, 28 questions, quite a few questions. But uh, hopefully you didn't find it too too bad. There was definitely a couple of uh, tricky ones, especially this one at the end with the graphs. But hopefully by the end of this video, you are, are in a better position for your exams and uh, any misconceptions or anything that you thought was tricky, uh, you understand a lot better now and you're in a better, you're in a better position. Uh, again, thank you so much for all the support. Uh, if you found this video helpful, then feel free to just drop a like, comment, subscribe, share with your friends, anybody that you think would benefit. And uh, yeah, what's left to do now is to go over to paper three. So that's going to be out very, very shortly. Uh, yeah, so uh, just keep, just uh, stay tuned and I'll see you for paper three. Take care. Bye-bye.